this is kind of broken into, into, into two, two main components here. We're using the MACD as a filter. So the MACD needs to be above the zero line and below 0.25, right? So we have this range in here of the MACD where uh, long signals are allowed to occur, right? If the MACD goes above 0.25, right, if it goes too high here, then no long signals, all right, or short signals, right? So no trades, basically. I guess, you know, what's being considered here is the MACD is kind of overextended, so you don't want to go long into a, you know, overextended market there. Um, and the same thing, you know, when the MACD is below the zero line here, right? So we have this range when the MACD is below the zero line and above negative 0.25, then that's the zone where short signals are allowed uh, to occur. And of course, if the MACD goes below negative 0.25, then no short signals. So there's our, our kind of our, our uh, signal filter using the MACD. And then the next part is looking for uh, these swing trend uh, or swing point breaks here. Right, so so what we have here is a, a downtrend, uh, and what we're, what he's trying to illustrate is when you're when you're going from a lower high down to a lower low, then basically uh, you know you're in a in a downtrend type of situations here, right? Or going from a lower high down to a higher low, as well. Uh, that keeps the downtrend, and then once this downtrend is broken here. So actually this, this line here should be down here with this second lower high, right? So this, this line here is not, is not extending out to the first lower high. It's actually this, this lower high here. So it should be lower right there. So that's what we're looking is for price to break the most recent lower high there. And then once we get that break, then that's a trend reversal. Right. And so if we get these trend reversals when the MACD is within its um, you know, range, then we'll get a signal. And that's when we want to see um, you know, a long signal um, from this setup here. All right, so um, I'm going to start off by doing the MACD component. That's going to be the most easiest. Right. And then we'll jump into to kind of defining... Um, this uh, downtrend versus uptrend and, and a break of the trend. Okay, so let's minimize that. And um, yeah, so I've got my chart uh, a little prepared here. So we've got the MACD on there and I, I put a white dashed line for the 25 and another white dashed line for the negative uh, 0.25. And then the zero line is the gray line, right? So we have these two zones here. Uh, yeah, that's going to see if I can slip a little marker in there. There we go. Like so. Yeah, so there's our two, two zones there. Um, okay. Let's see. Let's get Bloodhound open here. So we can see, right, then we got the empty template button on the top of our chart here. So that will open up Bloodhound. And there's our interface. Stretch this out a little bit. All right, so first thing you want to do is create a file name here. So let's hit the change button. And that'll open up our save as. And um, we'll put in today's date. So there we go, it's the 14th. All right, so once you have some kind of a, a file name created, then, then we can start going to work here. So, all right. So I'm going to switch over to the logic tab here, um, so I can start working on the logic board. Uh, but before I do that, you know, I need to create a logic template. So I don't have any logic templates uh, created yet. So we'll hit the new button right here, and that's going to create a new logic template right there. All right, let's see. Um, let's kind of come up a, with a name here. Let's see here. Um, okay, something like that. So we have a we're kind of building a basically a swing trend break. 
system, you know, with a, a MACD kind of range filter there. All right, so this, yeah, this MACD filter here, um, the best solver to use is the threshold solver here. So, yeah, this threshold solver was, yeah, specifically kind of made for this task to uh, identify, right, when an indicator is within a certain range, um, uh, you know, a certain value here. Right. So, um, let's see. All right, so I'm gonna give my, get this threshold solver, you know, some kind of a name here. So basically, we're trying to identify when the MACD, you know, is, is from the zero line to the 0.25, you know, whether it's negative or positive there. So let's, um, okay, next step, let's plug in the MACD indicator. So there's our MACD. Oh, and uh, let's see, we are using a custom period for the MACD here. Let me look that up. Okay, there we go. So 32, 5, and 5. All right, 32, 5, and 5. And we can see the MACD actually has three plots, right? So we want to make sure that you have the correct plot selected, and we're using the MACD line in this case. So that's already selected for us. So, all right, so we can, can hit OK. And before I go too far, let me change my MACD settings on my chart. So we're using 32, 5, and 5. There, OK. Let's open up Bloodhound again and switch over to the logic tab here and get, get back to the threshold solver. All right, so let's see, the values we are looking for is 0.25 and we're gonna put this in twice and then zero and yeah, I think, yeah, since we actually have multiple ranges here, so we actually got four different zones that we're working with that we're that we need to identify with the MACD, right? So we have this upper zone here, right? We have this upper zone, right, which is a, a no trade zone. So and we have this lower zone, which is a no trade zone. So that's two zones right there. And then we have two zones in the middle as well. So we actually have four zones um, that we're trying to identify here. So we're actually going to need two threshold solvers for this. Um, yeah, that's good. Yeah, so I think, yeah, let's try this at first. I think, you know, we just need 0.25 and then we can leave the rest on zero. Um, and so then down here in the long output, right? So getting our, our long output set up correctly is, is, you know, is the second critical part to, to getting this working right here. So we don't want an output when it's greater than 0.25, right? We don't want any output. So we want to leave this at zero, no output. But if the MACD is at 0.25, that's okay. So we want an output there. And then also if the MACD is at zero, that's okay as well. And anywhere in between zero and 0.125 is okay as well. Right, so if we look at this, kind of need to stretch this out a little bit, actually. Sometimes when you're building things, it's, it's, it can be helpful in changing your plot style. So I'm gonna use a dot here. Switch that over to a dot. Right, so there we go. So now we we can actually see on the chart that the MACD is in between our zones here and here and right there and right there. Right, so sometimes changing your plot style de temporarily, you know, helps you visualize what's going on here so you can see it a lot better. So we know that basically we got that threshold solver set up correctly, right, because we're not, because uh, we're only seeing along when the MACD is inside our little zone area here. Right. 
Okay, so that that is uh, one part. So we've got one part of the threshold solver set up correctly. Um, and so now we're going to need a second one, uh, a second threshold solver for, for the uh, below zero um, areas here, or zones. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take a little shortcut here. So I'm going to go over to the solvers tab, and we can see there's the, that uh, MACD threshold solver I just made. And I can make a copy of it like so. And then with this copy, I can go in here and um, make sure you, you update the name there because you don't want two solvers with the same name if they're doing different things. And so the other solver, I'll give it a positive 0 0.025. Right, so there we go. I got two solvers. One's a positive 0.25. The other one's negative uh, 0.25. And then you know, the good thing is the MACD is already, uh, is already uh, set up for me there. So now I can just go in here and I want to set these to zero, like so. And then go down here and go negative uh, 0 0.025 and go negative 0 0.025, like so. Oops. Hold on a moment. Negative 0 0.25. There we go. Yeah. yeah. Now you'll notice between these solvers, right? So with the positive, using the positive 0.25, the numbers are up top, right? And with the negative, the numbers are at the bottom. And that's because with the threshold solver, your, your threshold numbers need to be in descending order, right? So the highest number on top, working your way down to the lowest number on the bottom. So that's why these values had to be reversed like this. So highest number on top, lowest number on the bottom. And numbers in the middle go in the middle. And then and then lastly, all right, we need to turn these long outputs off and we need to figure out which of these short outputs do we want here. So in this case, um, at Let's see, at zero is okay. I think, we, yeah, we want these two right there. So, all right, so there we go. So we've kind of got um, this, our second threshold solver set up. So now let's go put it on the board here and test it out. All right, so we're gonna go to solver nodes and go to the existing nodes, right? Right there at top, existing nodes. And there is that new solver that we just built on, on the solvers tab right on the solvers tab over here. So let me go and click on that, add it to the board, and now let's connect it up. And then once we connect it up, we can take a look and see that everything looks correct. So yeah, and we can see that that guy right there is probably just barely below negative 0.25. It's probably just a fraction below below it. Um, and yeah, there's one that's just barely above uh, negative 0.25. So, all right, we just want to make sure that there's no shorts when the MACD is above zero and no shorts if the MACD is below negative 0.25. All right, so we know this one's set up correctly. Okay, so next, set those aside and we need a OR node, right? Because basically we're, we're using an OR node because it, it's taking two solvers to accomplish, you know, what we consider as, as one filter, right? One filter. Um, so if we connect both of these into the OR node, now we get our complete filter here, right? So we're getting along when the MACD is within right our long zone uh, and a short when our MACD is within the short zone right so so since it took two solvers to do this task then we join them together with an OR node so all right now with that uh, we can move on to the trend uh, component of this all right let's pull up that screenshot here so first thing we need to do is identify that the, 
the uh, swing points are creating this downtrend here. And we have uh, a shortcut built in to the swing trend indicator that should identify, I think it's gonna identify the type of trend here that, that David that David has, has created, uh, that David wants here. So let me shrink the MACD for a moment. We'll shrink that down. Then I'll extend this out here. So let's take a look at what I have on my chart. Uh, you'll notice, right, there's these labels on here, right? The, the lower, lower highs, higher highs, lower lows, right? So that is coming from the swing trend indicator. So I just put that on there just, just for the convenience of being able to see the labels there. So let's open up the indicator list. All right, so here's my indicators. And so it's the swing trend indicator. So I have that on the chart just, just so I could see the labels here, right? I have labels, show labels turned on. Everything else is turned off. So I just purely have this on there just for visual reference so we can see the, the labels. And so the swing trend is inside shark indicators and it's right there. So at the bottom, inside the Shark Indicators folder, it's the swing trend right there. All right. So that's indicator number one. But also, the swing trend indicator is going to, um, hopefully, we're going to do a little testing here, but I think the swing trend indicator is going to provide me with the, with the swing trend direction that David wants here. And we'll, we'll go into that in more detail in just a moment here. Right. And then the other indicator that I have, so you can see the green lines and the red lines, right, marking the swing points. So that is the swing highs and lows. So that's this indicator right here, the swing highs and lows. So I have that on my chart. And um, to get these swing points to show up as quickly as possible, I adjusted the number of swings to two. So I adjusted that down to two. Right. So, of course, when you're playing around with this, you know, you also need to kind of uh, experiment with the swing strength here as well. So obviously the swing strength, the higher the number, the less swing points you'll need. The lower the number, the more swing points you will get. So lower numbers will find all the little smaller, you know, swing movements in price. A higher number will, will only identify the bigger, longer-term swing swing points. Um, okay, that should, yeah, so that kind of covers it for the two swing indicators I have on my chart. So let's cancel that. Yeah, so let's talk about this swing trend identification that's built in to the swing trend indicator. So let me kind of show you, I'll start first in Bloodhound to show you, and then we'll go to the documentation page where it'll provide us with a lot more information. The documentation page will basically tell us what's going on here. Um, okay, so let's give this threshold solver a name here. All right, so we're trying to identify the swing trend you know, swing trend based on, you know, um, swing point, swing point action. And so let's go into the indicator list. And we're going to open up the shark indicators folder. And there's the swing trend. So we'll select that down here. Um, and of course, so remember the swing trend has a swing strength as well. So you're going to want the swing strength to match the swings, highs, lows indicator, right? That way your swing points all match up. Because remember, um, right? We're using the swing point, This I'm sorry, we're using the swing highs and lows so that we can identify, right, the swing points here. And so if we look at our screenshot here, right, we want to know when price breaks that most recent lower high. 
And so how do we do that? Well, we need a swing indicator that's going to plot the price of that swing point. Right? So we need an indicator that's going to plot this line for us. Um, and it's going to plot this line for us so that Bloodhound knows where that swing point price is. Right? And so, again, make sure that you know the swing trend indicator has the same swing strength as the swings highs lows indicator right let me, let me yeah I should, I should probably take a step back here and let's open up the indicator list again right so this if i click on the swing swing trend right it has a swing strength right here and the swing highs and lows has a swing strength so you need to keep those synchronized Right. Don't if you're gonna change one, make sure you change the other. Right. Otherwise, you know things will get out of sync. Okay. So let's kind of go back to um, threshold solver here, and let's go back into the indicator list. And what I wanted to show you is right in the swing trend. Uh, what what you can't see on the chart are these int series. Right, so we have an overall trend, a quick trend, a breakout trend, uh, and the immediate swing direction. Um, so there's even extra information coming from this, the swing duration, swing height, swing percent. Right. So, but what we're interested in is these trend outputs here. These, yeah, these various trend outputs. So, um, and I th think overall trend um, breakout. I think the breakout trend will identify uh, what David's looking for here. So, all right. So next thing we need to do. So I'm not done. I haven't finished setting up my threshold solver. So I need to set the outputs here like so. Right, and there we go. So now we kind of now we can visually see the trend there. And so before we get going too far, you know, you're probably gonna ask yourself, well, you know, what is the definition of overall trend, you know, versus quick trend versus breakout trend? You know, what's the difference between these different trend identifiers here? And that is where we're going to go to the documentation here. So let's go to documentation. And let's see here. Let's go, yeah, let's, let's jump over to documentation. All right. So on here, you can see kind of a quick list of all the products. And what we're interested in is the other indicators. So let's go to the swing trend, right? The swing trend indicator right there. So we can click on that link, and there you go. That'll jump us straight to the swing trend indicator. And also on the same page is the swing highs and lows. Right, so these, these two indicators are very tightly integrated with each other. So they're on the same page here. So here we go. So here's the swing trend. And if we scroll down, we can see here's a little image of the swing direction swing uh let's see um yeah here's a little image showing us the overall trend quick trend things like that so if you keep scrolling down here we go we want to go to the data series section right so oh, and if you keep scrolling here we go here's the overall trend quick trend and the breakout trend so you can read a description here now write a technical description of exactly what defines an overall trend, you know, and what defines a quick trend, you know, and then of course what defines a breakout trend. There, so there's a, a, a precise description on the documentation page there. So, and of course, if you're interested in in the other data, right? There's swing direction, swing duration, you know. There's a description of of how, where that data comes from and what that data is there, so.
All right, so let's see here. It's been a while since I've used uh, these three different trends here. So um, I'm going to, yeah, do a little testing here. I think, yeah, so just so happens to have a, like a, a, like a, a good s s situation here. Um, so you can see we went from a lower high to a lower low, and then we got a break of that lower high, like so. So actually, we went from a lower low. I'm sorry, lower high. All right, this is this is where I start getting uh, tongue tongue tied here with all these lower lows, higher lows. <laughs> um, so we got a lower high and a higher low. Um, and then another lower high, and then finally a lower low, yeah, to make that trend direction uh, change here. Although I think, yeah, I think David wants wants the trend direction to change a little quicker. Um, right, basically, as soon as we as soon as we get this lower high, I think that's that's saying that trend. Uh, direction has changed here so let's do let's do a little let's go into our indicator and, and change which trend we're gonna use here okay so that was the breakout one uh, let's do the quick trend let's see if that one let's see no that doesn't look like it either um, Uh, let's let's try the overall trend. Yeah, the overall trend is definitely that. That's the most restrictive one. Um, yeah, the overall trend has the most requirements here. So you can see sometimes we're not even in a trend. Um, so let's see. Let me go back to the quick trend. All right, yeah, we might have to define, we might have to, yeah, define our own kind of custom trend here. Doesn't look like that, those are working out for us. Let's see. Yeah. All right, yeah, so if, you know, so if, if, if we want a, lower high, you know, to be defined as uh, creating a downtrend. Uh, let's, let's see, let's go back to, let's go back to the screenshot here. Um, well, actually, yeah, so um, David, I'm kind of guessing here that um, when, when price, you know, breaks, yeah, so when we get this breakout, you know, of the previous, you know, swing high here, that must be a, so that's reversing to a long trend. Is that, yeah, I'm guessing that's basically defining a long swing trend. Let's see. So if we go back here, you know, if, the, if this was in a long trend back here, then... It's looking like I'm guessing here that when when price finally broke this swing low here, right? So we had these these prior swing lows that when price breaks them, we know a lower low is being defined, and so that's what's defining this downtrend uh, during this entire period here. Yeah. So if that's the case, um. Yeah, if that is the case, then I think we do actually want we want the breakout trend. Um, yeah, which I have selected there. Yeah. Now, I'm, so let's just I'm gonna go with that for now. And try and keep it simple here. And actually, let me you know, let me take a look at the questions and answers here. Uh, so yeah, David saying yes. Okay, cool. So. Um, yeah, so breaking, so when price is breaking, uh, let's, 
yeah, let's take a look here. Yeah, so we can see, so price, it broke this prior swing low, and so we went into uh, a downtrend. And then as price comes up, right, uh, the bar, right, price closes above the prior swing high, and so then it reverses to a long trend. And so we stay in this long trend because price is not breaking the swing low and it's not breaking the swing high. It's just kind of range bound in here. But then finally, yeah, we get we get um, the bar breaking the prior swing low. And so then we finally switch into a downtrend until price reverses back up again and breaks the swing high. So, all right. So we'll, we'll go with this. And so now, let's see what we want, is we want to get a nice clean signal out of this, uh, right? So in other words, we want just by clean signal, a clean signal, we just want one output on, uh, actually, we want, yeah, we want a signal on that bar. Yeah, we want a signal on that bar there. Okay, so we're gonna we want a long signal on that bar there. So we're gonna have to do a couple of things. Um, yeah, all right. So let's see. Let's all right. So let's rename this solver here so we know what it's doing, right? It's identifying the, the breakout trend, right? Uh, but we're gonna have to modify the output here, right? So look, so if we're looking for a long signal, if we're looking for a long signal when price breaks the swing high, but we also wanna make sure that, um, you know, it correlates with the swing trend, we need to reverse this swing trend here, right? Because this, this swing trend is currently giving us a short, but we're looking for a long signal, right? So they so there's a conflict there. So what we'll need to do is use the long short modifier like so. And we're going to use the swap mode. So we're basically swapping, reversing the longs into shorts and the shorts into longs, like so. All right. And so now we're getting a long output from that solver, you know, when we expect a long signal. So, right. okay, so we can set this aside for now. And the next thing we need to do is detect um, this crossover. Right, so we need to detect when price is crossing over this swing high, or if price crosses below a swing low. All right. So I'm gonna grab a crossover solver for this. All right, so let's see. So we're gonna detect when the close um, crosses over a swing high or swing low. Let's see, all right, so input A, we're gonna change that, switch that over to price. And there we go, so there's the closing price of the bar. And so input B, let's go in here, and let's select our swing highs and lows. And we remember on the chart, our number of swings is set to two. So we need to adjust that. Uh, the swing strength is seven, so we can leave that alone. Um, and what the plots that we're seeing on the chart here is the widest tops and the widest bottoms, right? So the green line is the widest tops, right? So the tops are the highs, bottoms are the lows. And so if price, you know, uh, crosses above the swing high, that's going to be 
the widest tops, we want a long signal when price breaks above, like so. There. Um, all right. So let's see what we have here. And, oh, yay. Sometimes you might get this, but luckily it's just benign. Uh, we're still looking into why that happens sometimes, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, but all you need to do is just reload the chart, and it all works. It works just fine. So let's let's take a look at um, what we got on the chart. Yeah, here we go. So price, right? Price broke below this swing low here, and we got that short. And then, um, yeah, see, price came back up. It broke below it again. Another short, and then right here, the close of the bar crossed above this swing high. So that's our long signal we're looking for there, right? Okay, so we have our crossover condition here. And so now we just need to start joining everything together. So let's see, let's let's grab an AND node. So we have our, our basically our, our MACD zone filter. Uh, we have our trend, uh, uh, our trend direction, and then we also have, you know, price crossing over uh, the swing lines. And, yeah, it's probably going to be kind of tough uh, with this MACD in a very narrow range, but, um, yeah, let's see if we actually generate any signals here. Yeah, there we go. There's one. Great. We actually got one. So yeah, so here's kind of the opposite. We had a uh, higher high going down to a higher low, and then a lower high, and then crossing that swing low. And our MACD is right there in the sweet spot, right there in that zone. So, all right, let's see here. David's saying the slow MACD should be 32, the slow MACD. Let's see. Well, David, you said uh, 32, 5, and 5. So is it supposed to be 5, 32, and 5? 5, 32, and 5. Oh, okay. Yep. All right. Yeah, so in your email, you want 32, 5, and 5. Okay, so let's switch those around here. That should be 5, 32. There. I'm sure that'll make a major difference. And then... Okay, so that that was adjusting the chart only. So we still need to go into Bloodhound and make those adjustments. Right? So we've got yeah, we've got the two solvers over here that need adjustments. So let's let's select on the top one here and then go into the MACD and make those adjustments. So 532 all right, so there's one, and then we'll go into the other solver and do the same thing here. So 5, 32, and 5. Okay, there we go. So now everything's adjusted, like so. And let's see, also, David wanted to put it on a Renko chart instead of a 5-minute. So let's switch our chart type. Uh, okay, I'm just going to use the Pro Rankos because uh, it's quick and easy. Um, there. And then let's see if there's any signals. Yeah, it looks like you're going to need to uh, adjust your MACD zones here for, for a rank of chart. Yeah, so let me go back to a five-minute chart here. Yeah, great. So here's here's that little area we were working on. And so now with the adjustments to the MACD, yeah, we got our long signal right there. All right, let's take a look back here. Let's see if we get anything else. Here we go. There is a short signal. There, and our MACD, yep, is just barely inside our little short zone. 
there when we get that cross. David's asking, why did I use a threshold solver for the swings? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, yeah, let's go down here. So this solver right here, uh, yeah, is looking at the swing. And yeah, so this threshold solver, right, is what's looking at the swing trend. And let's scroll down here. And so it's looking out at the breakout trend. Right. So, you know, so these trend, uh, there we go. So these three trend outputs, um, those are basically almost like signals coming from an indicator. Um, right. But, but, you know, instead of a, a discrete trade signal, they're identifying a trend, you know, so what, what do you have for a trend? Either you have an uptrend, downtrend or no trend. Right. So, what so the value in these um, outputs here is positive one for an uptrend zero meaning no trend uh, or zero meaning no trend identified right and then a negative one means you're in a negative uh, trend or a downtrend yeah negative one means you're in a downtrend positive one for an uptrend and so um, and so with the threshold solver, you know, we can identify whether that output is greater than zero or less than zero, right? Because that's what we want to identify is, is when that trend is a positive one or a negative one. And so with the threshold solver, right, uh, we want a long when that trend is a positive one and it and therefore it's greater than greater than zero right and what is a is zero so if that output is greater than zero we know it's a positive one for a long trend and then if it's a negative one then it's going to be less than zero and we know that that's a short trend so for the short output right so when you're using uh indicators that are basically giving you like trade signals or trend direction. You you use the threshold solver because you're looking for a positive one or a negative one or a zero coming out of that indicator. Yeah. Yeah. So again, right, the values coming out of these trend um, outputs here is positive one, zero, or negative one. Yeah, if we go to the documentation here, if I open up overall trend, yeah, so here we go. Right down here it says this will be a positive one for an uptrend, right? A negative one for a downtrend, and a zero, right, value means no trend direction. And that's the same for all of these, you know, right, right there. So, and so David's saying he thought threshold solvers are for indicators on the bottom of the chart. That is correct, right? Such as the MACD, right? And 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 look. So if you think of it this way, how are we using the threshold solver for the MACD? Well, we're trying to see, you know, is the MACD above 0.25, or is it below? negative two five right we're trying to identify that well we're doing the same thing we're doing the same thing with this trend output as well so yeah so this trend output it's going to be zero or positive one or zero or negative one and so we're trying to identify when it's a positive one or a negative one and the threshold solver is the best, it's the best solver because we can identify the long trend, right, and the short trend all within one solver there. And, yeah, and keep in mind that, you know, a, a handful of these solvers do have multiple uses, you know. So, generally speaking, um, you know, um, these solvers don't have just one locked-in task. Uh, you know, these these solvers are looking for conditions, 
and you know those conditions can show themselves in a variety of different ways so most of these solvers you know have multiple uses um, right so yeah so again since we're since we're picking on the threshold solver right you know the threshold solver it's multi, it's common most common multiple use is uh, right like working with the MACD stochastic CCI indicators but also the threshold solver can be used to work with with custom indicators that provide you with trend information or sometimes a discrete signal.